1 Corinthians 7. You know, last week we, uh, we talked about uh, just the thought of uh, uh, don't look. And we talked about, uh, you know, the, the necessity of, of uh, especially in our society, more so than ever. Uh, David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. We talked about that. We're, we're still on that thought of some, some, some principles to, um, to put in your, your young men. And, um, and, of course, the battle for um, men, and, and I realize, again, some of these things really overlap, and it's not just maybe peculiarly isolated to, to one spot, but, but the battle for men, more so than ever, revolves around their eyes. And, um, but I want to go with another thought, that, sort of the next thought in line with that tonight, 1 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let's pray. Lord, help us in these next minutes. Um, I just pray that you'd really help us, Lord, and uh, bless what we're going to say. Lord, uh, please bear witness to it in, the, in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so last week was don't touch. I mean, don't look. And tonight is don't touch. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Um, and you have to ask some folks. <laughs> I, well, of course, we're not talking about Christians. But, you know, you have to ask some folks, um, does that verse mean anything to you? Um we're talking about our young men, and we want to teach our young men um, that it is important that, you know, until the day they're married, that they, they really keep their hands to themselves. Um, I, uh, you know, as, as I'm going through this, you know, you, you, you know, immediately... The, the aim of this is towards teaching our young men. That's the aim of it. But a lot of these things don't apply just to, to young men. And I, I saw something, uh, actually something I've seen over and over, and uh, there's a preacher that I know. Of all people that you would think should, should really have a hold of these principles, it would be the preachers. But you know, preachers are just, they, they, they put on their pants the same way you do. I mean, they're just... You know, you you would think they would be walking with God and that they would have some of these things um, down pat. But I watched this guy, and every time I saw him, and he's married, got several kids, and uh, every time I saw him, he would uh, he would go up to people almost, we're talking about at church gatherings, um, people that he barely knew, and women, and he'd be, he'd be, um, putting his hands on them. Like, you know, he would shake their hand and then he'd go up, hey, sister, how you doing? He'd put his arm around her and then he'd be, and this is, this is where, this is where um, I, I, I would get uncomfortable off the chart and, and he's, he's rubbing her back and we're like, what are you doing? And, uh, you know, his, his excuse was, oh, you know, well, we're just, we're just brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, but what about what the Bible says? You know, that's where some of this stuff just defies the mind. It just, it's unbelievable. The Lord says clearly, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, what is the exception to that? Well, he gives it in the next verse. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Well, of course, you know, you, you know, that, that marriage bond, you know, that's where, you know, you can, you can hold hands and you can embrace and that, that whole nine yards is, is yours after the day you say your wedding vows. Um, I watched the same guy, and it was it was it was sad, but it was comical, um, and it was comical because this how this lady instantly reacted. The same the same preacher, a big big church gathering. I mean, there's a, a big a big revival meeting kind of thing, 
and they're having a dinner after one of the services. They have one of the guest evangelists there. The guest evangelist is probably around 70, and his wife was a little younger. And um, so this preacher goes up, and he sits beside the evangelist and his wife, and he's sitting behind his wife, and he, he, he puts his arm around the evangelist's wife. And he's just sitting there talking to her, and she abruptly gets up and goes and sits on the other side of her husband, which is what she should have done. And you're just going... There's something really wrong with this. Like really wrong with this. That this guy feels like he can do this. And again, what, what is he doing? He is violating a clear principle of Scripture. At my old church in Prince Albert, um, you know, we had, we had a bunch of young people. And um, we, uh, especially in the summertime, there went, after church, we, we owned our own building there. And so we had the church building. The church building sat on seven acres. So, you know, man, it was wonderful. And we had, uh, long before I had gotten there, there had been a Christian school there. So they had some sports equipment. They had goal posts. They had all sorts of stuff on the property. So in the warm weather, um, they would, um, the, the young people would go outside. And we also had a gym, which was wonderful. Because in the, in the cold weather, you know, we could play inside. So I'm gonna need I'm gonna need a helper here. Um, thank you, Jack. Man, he, you knew I was thinking about it, didn't you? So um, let's let's pretend we're playing soccer for a minute. Come on up here. And and I saw something, and then I banned it. See this scriptural principle. You you have to be careful, or you read into the scripture something that's not there. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Of course, only in the dating context. So any other time, it's fair game. Is that what the verse says? No. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Period. So that covers every day of the year, every situation. And so I'm watching my young people. And my young people weren't sinister. You know, and, 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 and you know, a lot of things start off that are just totally innocent. But um, but the devil works because he wants this violated. And all of us that are a little older, we all know why. So, Jack, here we go. Now, come, come on up, you know, we're, come on up. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I act like you're going to come in. When you come up here, act like you're going to kick the ball and freeze. Like, no, no, like kick the ball. Go ahead and bring your, this leg up. Okay. So what, what happens in, and you can put your foot in <laughs> Put it right there. We didn't practice this. Okay? So, so, so what happens? We had guys and girls both playing. And all of a sudden, you know what you're doing? You're, you're sparring for that ball and you get this going on. I saw that and I thought, we have got a problem. Thank you, Jack. I said, no more soccer. Now, a lot of people at that point would think I'm ridiculous. No, I'm not. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. It applies in all situations. Um, so, you know, you get, you get a lot of this thing going on where you get a lot of physical contact going on and it's like, okay, you know, um, we can play games, we can do things, but, but, um, but we need to make sure that scriptural principles apply at all times, at all times. Um, In, in the in, you know in the in the whole dating context, I'm just going to say this and quickly move on. And all of you that that are married, you understand all this very well. Uh, but you know you uh, you know there's a lot of dispute over this. There again, it's because people do not literally apply. They just they get this this approach in their mind where they they start doing tap dances, and then they then then they're hunting for an excuse, and that's where you get all these. Oh, well, you know, back in that day in the culture. and it... No. The wording of the verse is very clear. It's clear for all time and eternity. The Lord made it so crystal clear that you couldn't miss it unless you were going to miss it on purpose. You know, you get, oh, you know, well, it, it's okay to hold hands, you know. Well, you know, they're engaged and, and they're just going to hold hands. Or, or you know, it's, it's okay, you know, just... just 
Okay, all of us that have been down that road. We understand it never stops there. Never. That's why God said, God said, if you don't get on the road, you don't wind up at a destination that you don't want to wind up at. Um, it is good for men. And now again, please don't misunderstand me. Um, you know, in this room, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad for the past. Um, what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is a lot of us have wrestled with our past because it was not ideal. And I, I, there's a whole pile of us in this room that would nod our heads and agree, and there's no explanation needed. And we're saved, and it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise His name. But we would like to help our children. We would like to help our young men. And if we don't teach them this, then they're going to mimic what they see on Hollywood, what their friends are doing, what their girlfriend wants them to do, on and on and on it goes. If we don't, if we don't instill something in them, and the blessing is this is not just our opinion. This is not just some over-fanatical conservative Baptist nutcase that's trying to rob everybody of all their fun. No, it's the God of heaven who said... Wait till you get married. It is not good to touch a woman. So on that note, um, we need to teach our young men something. I'll never forget this. I have a few, a few memories of my dad. Just, just a few that are just extremely vivid. And I think the Lord did that. You know, I know my dad prayed for me and, and you never know what you're going to say that's really going to stick. And there's a few things. My dad, my dad got saved when he was 40. I was six at the time. And from that day till the day of his death, eight years later, he loved God with all his heart. And he was a witness at work. And, and he tried to, <clears throat> to teach my sister and I some things. And, um, and I'll never forget driving down the road one day. It was a Saturday. And I was in the pickup truck with him. And I was about 14. And um, dad, dad was working on the eternal reservation, renovation project at our house. And, um, and so we were, we were running into town to get some two by fours or something. And, uh, but that was real precious time because my dad worked a lot of long hours. And so when I had a chance to be with my dad in the pickup truck, it was, we were going to have the whole day together. And that was like, that was wonderful. I still, I still treasure those memories. The memory of the just is blessed. And I remember those things. Well, we come around this bend in the road and it's like a snapshot. I can still see the bend in the road. I remember exactly where we were. And dad starts this conversation. He said, now son, he said, you're getting to that age where you're going to start noticing girls. And I tried not to smile. <laughs> and he said, he's, and he starts down this conversation with me. The first one we had ever had and one of the only ones we would ever have, because he died a year later. We started this conversation, and he began to prepare me as best he could for the future. It's been 45 years. I still remember it, and I'm still thankful. You know, some of your best time with your sons Moms or dads, um, it's not always, you know, um, it, 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 sometimes it's just, the Bible says, Deuteronomy 6, talk of these things when thou walkest by the way. Sometimes God will just give you an opportunity. You'll be out at the store, you'll be driving down the road, and boy, just something comes up. And man, God can use that. So, so be on the lookout for those God-given, pray for those God-given opportunities because some of those things will really bless your, your boys and your girls. But we need to teach our young men, you know, this thing about touching them. Well, well also what comes into that is 
We need to teach them to avoid, like the plague, the woman who displays herself. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7. Without any instruction and without any guidance, if, if, a, if a young man just follows the course of nature, he's going to look, he's going to touch, and he's going to be drawn to the woman that invites that attention. And how does she invite that attention? Well, she'll invite that attention by dressing provocatively. Um, a woman that does that is inviting that attention. So without instruction, he's going to look. His eyes are going to be drawn like a magnet there. He's going to, he's going to want to hook up with her. And, um, and But we need to teach them. That, that actually is a very dangerous red flag. Look at Proverbs 7, verse 6. Solomon said, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. In other words, he was clueless. Had no instruction, didn't understand what he was doing. Verse 8. Passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the, and it's interesting. Notice the wording. He doesn't say, and there met him an harlot. Well, okay. But the Holy Ghost draws attention to something. There met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. And subtle of heart, she is loud and stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. Uh, we need to warn them about the woman that dresses seductively, dresses provocatively. She wears tight stuff. She's got low neck. She's, she's you know, dressing to accentuate her body shape and all that stuff. Um. A young man that I know went to a Bible school in Florida. Uh, well, he was he he didn't go there, but he was he was living down there, and there was a a friend of his, and he got to be he got to be really close friends with this family. This family attended this Bible college in Florida, and there's there's a few down there, and and if I said the one, you you would all know it, and um, it's where a lot of independent Baptists send their. Uh, send their young men and their young ladies uh, to, to learn, you know, all sorts of things. And, um, and he got to be really good friends with his family. And um, this family had a teenage daughter that really wanted his attention. And... Um, she dressed fairly immodestly. She she was she would dress pretty provocatively, and um, so we had this conversation with her, and he said, "You know, th this really isn't good. You know, do, do you realize?" And and he let her know because she she was really trying to bait him, and he wasn't interested. And so he told her. He said, "Look," he said, "I'm I'm really not interested." He said, he said, you know, I, I, I know you like me and all that. And he says, he says, I'm, I'm flattered by all that, but, I, but I'm not interested. And he said, but do you realize what you're doing by the way you're dressing? And here was her answer. She said, yes, I do. And nobody's going to tell me how to dress. Which means, in a young man with any sense, but he's, how is he going to have that only if his parents have drilled some things into his head that he should avoid her 
like the plague. Here's why. Here's why. She dresses like that. Before they're married, she insists that nobody's going to tell her how to dress. So what does that translate into after marriage? She continues to dress that way. That doesn't stop because now she's married. Oh, no. Because she likes that attention. And she likes, and, and, and this is crazy, um, you know, when you understand what's going on in all these men's heads that are looking at her. But she likes that attention. And you know what? Um, she's, not, she's never going to be satisfied with just her husband looking at her. You know what? You don't want your son married a girl like that. Avoid like the plague. We've got to teach our sons. Don't misunderstand me. Of course, she's, she's pretty. She dresses nice. You know, oh, sure, that's great. We're talking about dressing provocatively. You understand the difference? We've got to teach them to avoid like the plague, the woman that displays herself. But we must also teach them, we're talking about don't touch. Avoid like the plague, the woman who is overly friendly and very touchy. Let's read on in this same chapter. All right. Verse, uh, verse 11. She is loud and stubborn. Proverbs 7. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets. And lieth in wait at every corner. Now watch. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face, that means just very bold, like over the top, no, no inhibition whatsoever. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face. Man, she is laying it on thick. She is flattering him. She says, oh, I've been waiting for you. And I have found thee, verse 16. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry. Now she's luring him in. Verse 17, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Notice in verse 13 what she did. She caught him. And you say, well, that just means, you know, no, no, no. It, it, she, she, she initiated the physical contact. She caught him and she kissed him. You know, the Bible is very up to date, very current. Um, I think it was um, my third year of Bible school. Um, there were new, new people coming in and there was um Married, young married couples that were coming also. And I remember meeting this, this married couple one evening. It was just right before the semester started. And um, Mitzi and I lived there in Maslin, Ohio. So we, we lived right there near the school. And um, so there was this thing, you know, when a whole bunch of married couples got together. Well, we met this couple and, and you know, they... They seemed nice enough. They were actually very nice, very friendly, and we had a great time. And um, we got talking about how we all met. So here's how they met. She's in a laundromat doing her clothes. Some of you kids don't know what that is, but anyway. She's in a laundromat, and he's in, a la he's in the laundromat. Well, she's looking over there and she thinks this guy's really cute, you know, and and uh, she goes over, strikes up a conversation. And before she leaves the laundromat, she grabs him and she plants a big one on him. She kisses him. Proverbs seven. She's a believer. She's not a hooker. See, you read these passages and you think, oh, well, that's just no. God wrote that to tell you something. She's Christian. He's Christian. She grabs him. She caught him, verse 13, and kissed him. Next thing you know, they're seeing each other. Next thing you know, they're married. So they wind up at Bible school. Can I tell you how long the marriage lasted? I think it lasted two years. 
By this time, they're both about 30. And she dumps him for a 19-year-old. It would have been wonderful if somebody had taught that young man, run for your life. But nobody had taught him that. We need to teach our young men to avoid like the plague, the woman who is the young lady who is overly friendly, very forward, very touchy. She stands too close. She's aggressive. She's tempting. I'll never forget being in a church. I was on deputation. And Mitzi and I, you know, we, we had a few kids at this point. But I was traveling to a lot of churches trying to raise support. Um, and um, I wound up at this church <coughs> in Massachusetts. And I, I never had this experience. This may have been the only time. But I did my deal that night. A lot of people there, probably 150, 200 people. And this gal comes up. And she starts talking to me. And I mean, she is like right here. I mean, she, she was an attractive girl. And she's right in my face. And alarm buzzers. And I mean, we're not out in a dark corner of the parking lot. We're standing in the congregation. You know, church is over. People are milling around. And she comes up. And man, she is, she is like, hey, you know, wow, I really enjoyed your thing tonight. And she's like, and, and I'm like, oh, my soul. And, um, you know, I, I quickly, we're standing, I quickly navigated to where I could get a pew between me and her. You say, she probably didn't mean anything by it. Maybe she didn't, but she was dumb as a brick if she, if she didn't. <laughs> she was married! It'd been bad enough if she'd have been single, because I was married. But you know some of these gals, that doesn't fizz on them. You need to teach your boys. Some girl comes and she's, she, she likes to show her wares. Run. And if she's aggressive and touchy, run. Stay away. Look at Proverbs 5 and we'll be done for tonight. We actually read these verses the other day. But uh, but we're, we're talking about our young men tonight. Somebody said the book of Proverbs is actually divided in three sections. And it sort of looks like it is. It looks like the first 10 chapters were for young men. And then the second 10 chapters were for a different group. And the third 10 chapters for a different group. But you read those first 10 chapters and over and over and over and over again, Solomon says, my son, my son, my son, my son. Look at Proverbs 5, verse 1. My son, here's a man that's teaching his son. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. Boy, he's saying, boy, I hope you listen to me. That thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. He says, he says, there's some things you're going to do that you'll forfeit the ability to be a help to others because you'll wreck your life so bad that nobody will listen to you anymore. Case in point, Lot. He was so far down the hole, even his own family wouldn't listen to him. God says, through, Solomon says, this is my son. He says, listen to what I'm about to tell you so that you don't lose the respect that will give you influence with others. Verse 3, and what does he launch off on? For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end, a 19-year-old, is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, he says, son, he says, if you ever think I'm overstating it and you're, you're, just, you're just sort of pondering this thing, he said, don't forget, son, verse 6, 
Her ways are movable. He says, you, you can start dealing with these kind of women. They're unpredictable. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. You know, Hollywood makes it look like you can embrace one of these women and it'll just be happily ever after. But none of those folks on that screen are living happily ever after. Not a one of them. And they're living out this life. Verse 7, hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others in thy years <coughs> unto the cruel. <coughs> lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and thou mourn at the last. When thy flesh and thy body are consumed and say, how have I hated instruction? They come to the end of their life and they say, boy, I should have listened. Boy, I wish I'd have listened. How have I hated instruction in my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. We're going to stop there tonight. So when you teach our young men, don't look. But we also need to teach them don't touch. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, I pray for all these young people here tonight. I pray you'd bless them. I pray, Lord, that you would grant the desires of their heart. I pray, Lord, that, um, Lord, they would find that, that man or that woman that they, they dream about, that they long for. But God, help them, Lord, I pray. Oh, Lord, help them to do it on your terms, Lord, and help them to follow what you said. And, um, Lord, help them that you might build their house. And, um, Lord, keep them from all the snares in the meantime. And, Lord, the snares that our society is laying for them left and right. And um, Lord, bless the parents in this room. Lord, help them to be bold and kind, Lord, but, but swift to deeply impress these things upon their children. God, help them to realize the need to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before you leave, I want to illustrate something. And we're done. Some of you know the name... Jack Hiles, and you know, there's a but brother, brother Jack Hiles was, was a great preacher, especially back in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and he built a great work. Anybody that listened to him for any length of time always heard him talk about his mom. His dad was an alcoholic, his dad walked out on them very early when he was still a small child. His mother recognized the damage that liquor had done. And here's what, I'm, here's what I'm getting at. We're talking about teaching your kids don't look and don't touch. And you think, how do you do that? And how extreme and how, can I tell you, with some of these things, um, I, I suppose you could go overboard, but I just don't know of very many people that ever come close to that. And Jack Howe's mom so hated liquor because of what it had done to her and what it had done to their family. And this was Jack Hiles' earliest memories. He said, I remember. He said, my mom would go to the store and she'd get a magazine. And, and uh, back in those days, this was very common. The magazines would have full page liquor ads. You know, there'd be a great big picture of a bottle of whiskey or something. And he said, I remember my mom would tear that page out and she'd put it on the ground. And she'd look at me and she'd say, now, Jackie boy, see that? And little Jack, he says, now, Jackie boy, that's, that's liquor. That's whiskey. That's bad beer. That's bad. It's bad, 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 bad liquor, bad. And she'd say, now, Johnny, now, now, Jackie boy, you do that. Come on here. Say, say liquor, bad. And he'd say liquor, bad. She said, stomp on it, John, Jackie, stomp on it. <laughs> he said, that's how I grew up. He said, can I tell you, liquor was never a temptation. 
she taught me. Let me encourage you. You can teach them with a smile on your face, but we need to teach them. God bless you. You're dismissed.